Hello and welcome again to my channel, The Child with Special Needs. Today we're looking at uh, a rather different subject and it's the impact of having a, a special need, in particular a sight loss, on a child's mental health. I'm going to share with you the bones of some research and an article that I wrote for a sight loss magazine on uh, children's mental health and the implications of sight loss. First of all, I'm going to start by sharing some real cases with you. Although they're real cases, uh, there, there's no way of identifying the children. The names have been changed and the circumstances have been changed and they're very much summarised anyway. Ben has albinism. He has a particular form of albinism that only affects the eyes. But as with all albinism, it does result in quite a severe sight loss. When he started school, he was made by the teacher to sit on his own at the front. Other children in the class made comments to him, like, why do your eyes wobble? Ben knew his eyesight was poor. Far away, everything was blurred. Even close up, it was still blurry, although it was just about bearable. As time went on, Ben became isolated and unhappy in school. He found school stressful and exhausting. He had few friends there. Throughout his primary school years, Ben battled with social anxiety. He preferred the company of older people, like teachers and older family members, who understood him and didn't judge him. He always felt he was different. It was worse when he started secondary school. He wore a cap as a shield from the sun. He sat in the front seat. He had a learning support assistant attached to him. He had coloured paper. In addition, he was made to use an iPad to see the board, which as it was turned out a mixed blessing because it caused a lot of jealousy with the other children. Throughout his schooling, Ben experienced persistent anxiety and depression and was under therapy for most of his secondary years. Another boy, Oliver, has aniridia. That's the absence of an iris causing severe structural alterations to the eye and a severe visual impairment. In primary school, Oliver couldn't see people's faces, or he couldn't tell one person from another. As a result, he struggled to make friends, although he was a very sociable boy. What worried him most in school was being laughed at and not being popular. He felt anxious and depressed during most of his primary school years. He often had thoughts of suicide and went on to therapy. When he went to secondary school, oddly, it improved his mental well-being. Because of his IT skills, he became quite popular and his confidence grew. However, he continues to have therapy. Amy has nystagmus. That's the condition where the eyes wobble in a horizontal manner constantly, there's no control over it, and it reduces your visual acuity quite significantly. When Amy started school, she hid her eye condition. She didn't want others to know about it. She pretended to see when she couldn't. She felt people were looking at her eyes. Amy had few friends in school. She was shy, insecure, and lacked confidence. She appreciated the visits of the QTVI, that's the teacher of visual impairment, that was me, as it was the one time she felt understood. She didn't feel the teachers understood or appreciated how bad her eyesight was. Amy never had counselling and she struggled throughout secondary school and left without any qualifications. One thing I increasingly found when I was working as a teacher of visual impairment is that along with impaired eyesight, many students also have 
quite significant mental health difficulties. And those are often undiagnosed, unrecognised, and therefore, as a result, untreated. Anxiety is the fastest growing mental health challenge among young people today, and those with sight impairments are increasingly vulnerable. One in nine five to 15 year olds have a mental health condition, but one in three young people with a vision impairment have a mental health difficulty. The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual recognizes his own abilities and can cope with the normal stresses of life. A state of well-being comes partly through knowing you have supportive friends and family who accept you unconditionally and without judging you. It's knowing that you are connected to and belong to a wider social network. It's feeling safe and secure. It's having a sense of purpose, a passion that drives you on towards your goal. Or as the World Health Organization puts it, that you can work productively and fruitfully, able to make a contribution to your community. It's knowing your strengths, knowing that you are on target to achieve your potential. It's knowing your value and that you have a contribution to make and a role to fulfill. It's feeling hopeful about the future. If any one of these conditions is removed from the world of a child, it can put them at risk of mental health distress. Almost all of the young people I interviewed had experienced some form of teasing or bullying. A recent report from 2015 found that bullying has lasting effects on emotional and psychological development. One young lady that shared her experiences is Molly Burke. You'll find her on YouTube. She tells a disturbing story how some girls offered to do a makeover for her and instead wrote horrible words all over her face. Molly attempted suicide, but now she is a powerful advocate of vision impaired young people. Social anxiety is a sense of being isolated. It's an overwhelming fear and sense of unease in a social situation. It can affect a vision impaired child who is singled out as being different and unable to join in games. It's a fear that people are scrutinising you and judging you. Anxiety is a healthy mechanism, normally, that acts as a protective device. We all experience it, but it becomes a disorder when it stops you doing things and prevents you going about your daily life. It can become particularly acute around the adolescent years. 50% of all mental disorders start around the age of 14. This is a time of rapid brain growth and neurological changes. New cells grow and sprout new connections. Weak connections are pruned away. About this time, one of the changes that takes place is to do with the sense of self and identity. Thinking about yourself is high priority at this age. Experimenters tested this. They arranged for volunteers to sit on a stall in a shop window display. Then they pulled back the curtains and let them be exposed to the public, to people passing by looking into the shop. Their aim was to test how teens and adults differ in the way they react to social stress. They were put in a socially awkward situation for an objective measurement, they were hooked up to a device called a GSR, or galvanic skin response. This measures how much the sweat glands open. It is one measure of a person's level of anxiety. What was the result of being stared at by strangers? The adult levels were static, but the teen stress levels demonstrated extraordinary levels of sweating, shaking and trembling. Children with vision impairments in school often feel insecure. 
This may be highlighted when familiar adults are absent. A learning support assistant employed in schools is, is there to work with a child to ensure materials are accessible. But to a vulnerable young vision impaired child in reception class, the adult support worker is not just another adult. She is their rock, the person who is a constant presence with whom all the changes and transitions they can experience together. The relationship between them is close and trusting. The child feels safe and secure when they're present. So when that adult is not there, the child feels anxious and insecure. Unfortunately, the support system can sometimes be part of the problem instead of part of the solution. We have all come across children who are over-supported and have developed a form of learned helplessness in the classroom. One of my students had the same learning support assistant for all his primary schooling and it was clear he had an unhealthy dependence upon this person. There was no other adult who understood his needs as well as she did. Unfortunately, this meant that when she was not there in the class or when she was absent for prolonged periods, the boy was unable to function effectively and would appear unusually agitated and anxious. This situation became acute during year six when his LSA was in hospital. The parents said he had bad dreams and was constantly sad. He was quiet, withdrawn and didn't want to go to school. Another pupil has a vision impairment and additional physical needs. At first he struggled to keep up with lessons. At times, especially if the material was not adapted and he found mixing socially with other children very challenging. In the first year, his support worker was absent for three weeks. His behaviour changed. He slept badly. He experienced night terrors. He became depressed, anxious and withdrawn. He refused to go to school. The situation was eventually resolved by splitting the support between two LSAs and so reducing his dependence upon one single adult. For all these children, the supporting adult is a railing to hold on to. When that railing is not there, they feel fragile and insecure. Mm -hmm.